listening to The Donor Doctor Show, where your host, James Newberry, will help you improve the health of your fundraising. Now over to Jane. Hey, this is The Donor Doctor here, and I'm with my friend Stuart McLean, and we're going to talk about David Ogilvy, uh, the, uh, the master of advertising. He's been uh, dead 20 years, but... Uh, I've been uh, reading his books lately, and he has two YouTube videos, one uh, interviewed by John Crichton and the other at his estate. So he, uh, for, for, for younger people, he's still around. Um, you're a big fan of uh, David Ogilvy, isn't that right? Yeah, I was uh, assigned to read uh, his books when I was a cub copywriter back in the 80s. He's, uh, he's quite good. Uh, I took a few things that he said about agencies or organizations, which I thought were interesting. He said, talent is most likely to be found among nonconformists, dissenters, and rebels. Um, what do you think of that? Well, that's certainly been my, my experience. The, uh, you know, being a rebel or a dissenter doesn't necessarily mean that you are rude. It just means that you have ideas and you're willing to be assertive about it and make your case for it. And... Uh, Sometimes uh, people, especially uh, supervisors, can take that as being insubordinate when it's not. Uh, I think you should cherish people who are polite dissenters, who have ideas and can back them up and are willing to test. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of conformity out there, and I kind of understand. I have a friend who runs uh, these um, laser tag stores. And if you have a, you know, with a lot of young employees, you want conformity. You want people following the rules, obviously. But for an advertising agency or any kind of creative thing, you really want people who are thinking uh, differently, kind of adding to the mix. It's not enough just to do follow a formula. You really need people out there innovating. And I think you want to create that. And some of the things he said was, uh, he said, are you having fun? He said, fun agencies are more creative and successful. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. If you're having fun, it means you're comfortable, you're relaxed, and you feel free to be yourself. Right. And if you don't have those things, if you feel like you have to uh, work under a dark cloud every day because uh, there's a corporate culture that frowns on any individuality, then you're not going to be as good as you can be. You're going to end up having your spirit crushed, and you're there to get a paycheck. Yeah, that's, that's not good. He, uh, he used an example in two of the YouTube videos of the Russian dolls and how, you know, they get smaller and smaller until they're... The Matryoshkas. Yeah. And he said that if you have a, a boss that is uh, confident and, and would hire somebody who's maybe better than, than them or has the potential, you have an agency of giants. But if you have one that... Sometimes people prefer people who are more compliant, but maybe less talented. And then you, he said you have an agency of midgets. So I thought that was an interesting uh, an example. He used in both, so uh, something he thought was important. One thing I found interesting, because most agencies, they have you know a copywriter and then an AE, separate functions. But he actually thought there was something to be uh, desired in being a generalist, somebody who had both functions. What are your thoughts on that? Well, a lot of agencies like to divide things that way. I'm not really sure why. Maybe they think that one doesn't go very well with the other. I don't know. But uh, I've certainly preferred to do both. In fact, the reason I left my first agency job was because they shuttered me away to write copy. And uh, they didn't want to hear from me until... The copy was done, and then uh, we'd all go home for the weekend, and then Monday'd roll around, and I'd get another assignment, and I didn't have any input on the assignment. And uh, sometimes I got uh, copywriting jobs that weren't well thought out, and the account executive was just afraid to say no to the client, right? Because the client uh, thought sudden such was a good idea, right? Right. And the the account executive probably doesn't know what will work in the mail or not, as, as well as the copywriter. That's true. Uh, the copywriter is the, really the one with their fingers on the pulse. Right. And uh, 
I really think that the, the concept and the copy is the tougher of the two jobs. Uh, I do think that there's a lot to be said for somebody who is good with people. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and clients want to know that you care about them. And, you know, it goes beyond the work. They want to know that you are enthused about what they do and uh, that you like working with them personally. And I think uh, if that comes through and you're the copywriter and the account executive, it really makes to cement a strong, loyal relationship. He also said he believes in new blood. Some agencies like to promote from within. They just like to hire their own people, train them, you know, maybe out of college or something. Other people try to get people a little older, maybe, experience, different experiences. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think both can work. Uh, it really depends on the people. Right. You know, if you've got the kind of person that I like to work with, and that's, I call them a student. They're a lifelong student of their occupation. They want to go hear speakers. They want to read new books on their own time. Uh, they want to share their work and get together with the others in the office, even if it's just for a long lunch in the conference room, and say, hey, did you see this? I just tested it, and it did 18% better than right. the same version, but it didn't have this headline. Yeah. And, uh, you know, those kinds of people are continually, they're, they're transfusions, if you will, right. to use that analogy of new blood. So you can be there a long time. It really just depends on your attitude. I, I would agree with that. I've learned a lot by, um, I think I would be more inclined to get people that are experienced, maybe different kinds of experience. One of the guys I worked with that you, we both worked with was Craig Cap, And he had an advertising background. And he was very interesting. He had a different perspective. And I think sometimes even people who came from maybe a different creative agency or different something different, they just look at the world differently. They may have had some, something different. And I think a lot of agencies, they, they just when they hire from within, they don't realize that the group think that goes on. Um, I go to these DMAWs every year. And I was, this one agency was very clever in their scientific, you know, their, their, their statistical modeling and all that stuff. But the, they just didn't understand some basic concept that somebody maybe from a different agency would get. And it would, I think that, I think it's helpful to have a, a divergent views uh, for an agency. Well, I remember uh, Craig Cap. He taught me something. I was reading his pieces and I was studying them. I wasn't just reading them. And I thought about it, and I, I went over to his office, and I said, you know, Craig, reading your direct mail is like reading an advertising newspaper space ad. Yeah, yeah. I and he that. looked up at me, and he said, thank you. <laughs> That's very good. He had pictures with captions interspaced right. within should, his always letter. Always have a, a caption on the picture photo. He was and, on that. you know, I had never done that before. Oh, really? I oh. never had it Ogilvy, in the body. Ogilvy says that's a big thing to do. Well, uh, Craig taught me, so thank you, Craig. Okay, well, the, the one last piece of advice, he says, don't fritter away time in committee. And I know you understand that. You really can't write copy in committee. You know, what a waste of time. Yeah, a lot of people waste time in committee. And I, I sometimes think, God bless them. Right. I sometimes think supervisors like to have meetings because it gives them satisfaction that they're supervising people. Right. They've got all the, you know, they're the mother duck and they lead everybody into the conference room and everybody sits down at the table and they're at the head and they feel like a leader because they're supervising a meeting. Right. What a waste of time. Well, anyway, here are some of his others. Uh, of course, David Ogilvy was a direct response guy, and he had kind of he was uh, he preferred it to like general advertising because it's more measurable. And uh, he his criticism of TV advertising and a lot of general advertising was too interested in winning awards. And uh, he said TV ads in, uh, put an emphasis on entertainment over selling. And I don't know how many times I've heard this, but somebody will say, "Oh, I love that ad," and I'll say. Well, who was it for? They said, well, I'm not sure it was. <laughs> They'll tell the story. But obviously, it didn't influence their buying decision if they can't even remember who the ad was well, for. Well, that, that's certainly true when you have television shows about, uh, you know, 2015's funniest TV commercials. 
Yes. It's about entertainment. It's not about selling the product. Right. Now, there can be, there, there's there been a recent commercial on that I remember who the advertiser is. And so I, I thought it was entertaining, but a good commercial because I got the commercial message. Right. And that's the current ones with uh, Tarzan and Jane swinging through the trees. And Tarzan doesn't like Jane asking the monkey for directions right, in the right. jungle. <laughs> You know. Yeah. Well, the Dos Equis ads, which are being discontinued, mm -hmm. uh, the most what one uh, interesting man in the world, yes. that has resulted in, in higher beer sales. So, I mean, there, that's an entertaining ad campaign that has worked. Yeah. I, I remember years ago meeting with another uh, direct response creative, uh, and he ran an agency, and he said, you know, those California raisin commercials with the claymation in it. The right. claymation movement of the raisins was supposed to be such a big breakthrough. But as he pointed out, he said they're not selling any more raisins. Yeah, so it's no it's no good. No. No. So anyway, uh, his advice was not to bunt, to aim for a home run, aim for the company of immortals. Okay. He says Immorals or immortals? Immortals. Okay. <laughs> he says uh, big ideas come from the unconscious. But the unconscious has to be informed by research. Uh, one of his famous ads was the man in the Hathaway shirt. Do you remember that one? Is the guy with the iPad? Yeah, I sure do remember that one. And uh, it's the eye patch, and he showed one ad, the eye patch, and there were some cards there, and it lends itself to stories. Why does a person have the eye patch? Was it in the war? Was it, you know, his eye disease or something like that? Is he playing? What card game is he playing? It's, it's an example of. Uh, it appeals to a story. Do you ever heard of a guy by the name of Moshe Diane, the general from Israel? Oh, yeah. yeah. He's the one who yeah, saved Israel's patch. bacon. He had an eye, eye patch, right? Yeah, the so, Six-Day War. I was young, but I remember seeing a guy with an eye patch, and I said to my mom, well, who is that? You know? So, so uh, eye patch does have story appeal. He knew that from his research. That So he always believed this, and this has an application in direct mail, is uh, photos with story appeal. Mm -hmm. Something where people are interested in it. Um, of course, you know, like in animals, you're thinking the before and after. You know, that, that tells a story. Um, but just the eye patch was an interesting. It's something he used for 19 years, I believe it was. Um, I thought something that impressed me about David Ogilvy is he resigned accounts he no longer believed in. If he couldn't use the product himself, he wasn't interested in it. I know you've given up accounts before that you just no longer believe that they were fulfilling their mission or, or doing what they said? I have. I, I had problems uh, with one or two over the years, and I felt, uh, you know, they may have started out with uh, good intentions and, and did what they said they were going to do, but somewhere along the line it just became a job to them. There wasn't the passion yeah. anymore, and they re weren't doing anything maybe more than the absolute minimum that they, that they had to. And uh, I just wasn't enthused about that anymore. I didn't see them as really making a difference. Other people would want to keep them to make money. I know uh, when I dropped it and my agency dropped it, it was picked up by another There's agency. always somebody else. There's always somebody else will do it, the dirty work. So, but they have to make, you know, you have to be true to yourself. So I think you did the right thing. Now, one of the things he said about rules is that they really are more like guidelines. And they're guidelines only at one, one time. But in other words, what works today may not be true five, ten years from now uh, in a particular niche. So that's something to, something to keep in mind. Now, here are some of the, the, uh, the things he, uh, he really believed the importance of a headline. And I guess in direct mail we'd be talking about the, the outer envelope, maybe the first line or two of the letter, maybe the overline or Johnson box, something like that would be the equivalent. But he thought that was 80% of the success of the, of a, say, of a print ad was the headline. 20% body, 80%. And if you think about that, that means that 80% of your focus should be on, on having a really good uh, start because I mean, so often you see a letter that kind of like starts to... Uh, Without any purpose. It, 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 Four page score two. and seven years ago. <laughs> it's to like be page or two. not to be. Yeah. Page two that where they finally get into the, the good stuff. Um, well, you know, I'll tell you a little something about that real quickly. 
I, uh, when I was a cub copywriter, I was taught that a good carrier headline was what helped people get into the the appeal. The appeal. Right. And I didn't fully appreciate that. Uh, I was putting a lot of effort into writing my letters in my right. first months at the agency, and that wasn't necessarily wrong. But I still hadn't developed an understanding of the importance of the carrier. And uh, I was taught that the carrier really is like a store front window. Mm-hmm. Its idea is to get your attention and get you to come in the store. Right. And the carrier gets us to come in and read the letter. And I remember at my apartment building one evening coming home, there was a trash can between the two elevators and right above the trash can was the elevator call button. Behind us were the mail slots for the apartment building. So what did people do when they're coming in in their coats and ties and pantsuits? They push the elevator button, turn around, get their mail out, and start sorting it right there while they're right. waiting for it's the elevator. It's an experiment, you can see. Yeah, it's an anecdotal experiment, but uh, I watched this one guy come in, and we're waiting for the elevator together, and he had about eight pieces of mail that he was sorting as we're waiting for the elevator to come down. It was only a five-story, so it wasn't like a New York City high-rise. Right. But in just in that short amount of time, he went through his mail. I would guess that six out of the eight pieces of mail he stuffed in the trash can between the two elevators, and then the door opened, and he got in with his briefcase and two pieces of mail that went up to his apartment. Yeah, so only... So six of them, you know, 75% percent yeah, didn't even make it. Um, here are some other things he thought that were that were good in headlines. Uh, they may have application direct mail. Let, let me let me see if you think so. He said headlines that are helpful increase response. Uh, he he gave an example of like um, how to take stains out. He had like uh, blood and other kind of stains. Um, he, he he said that that might work because of uh, you're you're helping people. You're giving them value. And there's a little bit of reciprocity. Like, well, they help me. Maybe I should pay attention. I, I don't know if that's true or not. Um, well, you gave them something of value. Right, right. So some goodwill is developed. Right, that's the reciprocity, sure. People read headlines five times as much as, uh, as body copy, which I think makes sense. That's why if it's 80-20, it probably, probably is true. Uh, he said headlines with benefits get read four times more on average. He said headlines with news are recalled by 22% more people. This was an interesting. Headlines with quotes increase response by 28%. This one was very interesting. Headlines of 10 words outsell shorter ones in general, which goes against, because I've been saying less is more, you know, like looking for like a three word or something like that. Mm-hmm. But he said 10, so that, that, that's I find that interesting. Maybe that was true then, not now. Who knows? Uh, probably depends what those words are, obviously. Um if you are appealing to a small niche, put a word in the headline that will flag them down. And when he was appealing to like high end, uh, like you know, with fancy cars and stuff like that, he was he would use words that were, uh, you know, advanced words. You know, so he was you know, part of a snob appeal, I suppose. Um, he said research is the key for key for creation. One of his most famous ads was for Rolls Royce, and the the uh, the ad was at sixty miles an hour. The loudest thing you hear. Uh, in a Rolls Royce is an electric clock, is the electric clock. Um, but he didn't create that. He found that in a magazine uh, hmm. article, an old one. So that's, again, again research. A lot of the creativity he associates with him is, is really um, just good research. And, and I, I, we, we talk about Gallup was the first job he had in the United States. Yeah, but he also knew what to pick out. As oh, important, no question. That's a, that's a very important skill because a lot of people would miss that. You know, most most people would miss it. Absolutely. Uh, body copy loves testimonials, and testimonials work for, of course, direct mail as well. Uh, oh, not afraid to use fancy words. I already mentioned that. Celebrities were overrated, in his opinion. I know you kind of believe that too. I do. Uh, it helps if they have a tie to what you're marketing. But uh, they don't. They may get people's attention, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to buy because of it. Getting the attention is is important. I I agree. I I kind of think prefer to downplay the celebrity. That's interesting because he he used Eleanor Roosevelt to sell margarine, and people forgot the product. Of course, we now know that butter is better than margarine anyway. 
<laughs> so maybe anyway, he might not even advertise it. Um, he thinks copy should be in serif font. There's, that's not controversial. He said readable in three columns was for a print ad. Uh, photos should have captions. He was a big believer in that, and he hates reverse type. That's that's uh, generally what most people believe. And he says the the last uh, thing he thinks uh, to make a print ad to look like an editorial. Uh, I think they call them advertorials. Yes, they're 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 that increases uh, the amount that, that's going to be read. Absolutely, he does. likes guarantees. Now we don't do that a lot in direct mail, but it's something to consider. Guarantees. Um, to, to do more of them. You know, I've never seen somebody do, you know, if we don't get this. Um, uh, have you ever seen that in direct mail? Oh. Fundraising? I mean, uh, fundraising. Oh, in so, fundraising? I haven't seen I mean, uh, yes. Yes, other commercial direct mail, for sure. No. I don't know. I was just wondering if... Uh, I mean, you can't really say, I guarantee we're going to defeat such and such a candidate, you know? Well, I mean, if you have, if you don't like the, the uh, leather jacket, we send money back. You know, you don't like to, um, you know, if that was a premium or, you know, a hat or something. If you don't like this or if you're unhappy with the job we're doing, I mean, it's not impossible that you, you could have this. And, and I think you'd be fine. You're not going to have very many people complain. Um, but it's, it's something to consider. Um, I've never seen it done, so it'd be new. Uh, and, and again, he was a, a great researcher more than an, than an actual creator of advertising. That's where he considered his strength. And I think it stems from his background. Um, a little bit about, about his background that's interesting is he he went to Oxford, but kind of flunked out. He got a scholarship there. He's, he's Scottish, but he, li- he was raised in London. He sold stoves door-to-door in Scotland. That has to be a tough job, a real high-end one. He worked at a fancy French restaurant, uh, had a, had, a, had a very interesting life, and I think that all that stuff probably helped him. Now, he also did some charitable work. Uh, Wildlife, World Wildlife Fund was one charity, and another was the United Negro College Fund. And it, uh, I have printed out the letter, and I'd like to read it and get your comments. Because I, even though it did, it did raise $26,000 just from people on a, on a train, uh, which is around $150,000 today, maybe, maybe a little bit more. I think there's some flaws in it. I think you'll probably agree with me. Again, it's the United Negro College Fund, uh, June 24, 1968. So this is this is right around the riots. King uh-huh. had been assassinated. Bobby Kennedy also. Yeah, on the right are all the famous people that I even recognize it. Uh, this is many years later. From David Ogilvy to commuters: When this train emerges from the tunnel at 108th Street this evening, look out of the window. You may see some of the 1,125 boys and girls from New York ghettos who are now on vacation from our Negro colleges. At least you will see some of those homes from which they come. They are high-risk students with high potential. Your own college won't take them because they cannot qualify for admission. In the New England colleges, there are now 300,000 students. How many of them, do you guess, are black? About 2,000, two-thirds of 1%. Words fail me. If you are like most of the commuters on this train, you are a college graduate and you have supported your college faithfully over the years. After dinner tonight, will you do something imaginative? Will you write a check for a group of colleges whose alumni, alumni, through no fault of their own, are simply unable to carry the whole load of supporting their alma mater? I refer, of course, to Morehouse, Fisk, and Tuskegee, and the other 33 other predominantly Negro colleges which belong to the United Negro College Fund. About 40,000 students, most of them Negro, are now enrolled in these colleges. Their graduates include 85% of all Negro doctors the, and most of the leaders of the Negro community. The vast majority of them have very small income compared with yours. Last year, 50 predominantly white colleges received $416 million in gifts. For our 36 Negro colleges, we are trying to raise $6.5 million this year. Will you help? Without quality of education, there can never be equality of opportunity. This is the heart of the country's most urgent problem. Will you help? I dare to suggest that you send our fund a percentage of the amount you are giving to your own college. 10%, 50%, you be the judge. Don't reduce your gift to, this in parentheses, to your own college. Simply give our fund something on top. Here are the guts of the situation. Uh, The doors of the UNCF colleges are open to all regardless of race, creed, and national origin. They are not segregated, nor are they educating their students for a segregated world. Their faculties and boards are integrated, and the number of white students is growing every year. Two. Our average cost of tuition, books, room, and board is uh, $1,375. This compared with $2,400 at a predominantly white college. This is obviously dated. Yes. Because <laughs> even seven times that, it's, it's way more than that. 
Uh, Three out of four of our students are working their way through our colleges. On top of that, our colleges give financial assistance to more than half of their students. A great many more need it. UNCF is the largest fund drive devoted to the Negro cause. Many people feel it is also the most constructive. Uh, and then there's some quote from some guy. Uh, Please decide how the w- now what percentage of your gift to your own college you wish to send to UNCF and mail it in the envelope I have enclosed. Perhaps you will then sleep a little better during the long, hot summer. Yours sincerely, David Ogilvie, Chairman. P.S. A gift of stock would be equally valuable. And, uh, you know, it's an excellent letter. Obviously, it did well. It made 26000 um from people who had never given before, primarily just people on a train. But I had some, some criticisms, and uh, let's see what you think of my criticism. Uh, the letter doesn't identify David Ogilvie. I imagine most people know in New York, but not everybody's in the advertising field. You know, there, there are other businesses. Uh, it, it assumed it, it never tells his story. I mean, he is a very interesting person. He's, he's an immigrant. Uh, he went to Oxford. He, he didn't graduate. He went two years, but that would be kind of a humorous. It would be interesting. Uh-huh. He never shares his story. He doesn't even identify him as Ogilvie and May. They're advertising. So it assumes every 100% name recognition, which is usually a mistake, even a, you know, with a, a, on, a, on a commuter train like this. It doesn't have a reasonable ask for money. It's fine to say we need to raise six and a half million dollars, but you need to break it down. Maybe, maybe say we, you know, um, your thirty dollars could buy the books for a student for a semester. That kind of thing. Um, it, it doesn't break it down. Um, the PS on stocks is too forward. Uh, just starting relationship really with these people on their first mailing, you're not really looking, expecting for the huge donation. It kind of reminds me of a story my son told me about. This girl he'd been dating, and I was asking how she was doing. Oh, she dated this guy on a football team when we were watching the football game. And uh, she broke up with him because after the first week, she he wanted her to meet the parents. Apparently, this is too, too fast, turn off, you know. Because, like, week two, you're going to get engaged. Week three, you're going to get married. It's, it's too much to ask for stocks on the first. You, what you try to do is get a donation and then upgrade them over time. So I think the PS is is poor. It's too tacked on at the end. Yeah, it's a, it's a poor PS. There's just uh, uh, it's 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 really bad. Um, it doesn't have a match or deadline or any of these kind of techniques that we know work. Um, it doesn't probably have as much urgency. You know, we've raised four million of that six and a half million, but there's been a downturn. We need it now more than ever with all the problems going on. Um, it doesn't flatter the prospective donor enough. It has a little bit, you know, it assumes you're a college graduate and you're donating to all these things. Um, but for instance, it starts off with commuter, which is a kind of a impersonal salutation. I know you've used things like community leader or something of this sort. Yeah. Do you have any other criticisms of this? I mean, it was a successful thing. And who, who might have criticized David Ogilvie? But he's, he's not, he doesn't write direct mail fundraising letters a lot. So. No, that that was what I would expect an advertising man to come up with. It's what it shows. It shows it shows a real good understanding of storytelling, uh, but not some of the like the the smaller the smaller tricks of the trade that a direct mail copywriter would know. Yeah, uh, I I think all of your criticisms are valid. You know, even just some small things like, uh, you know, I I don't recall when that was given out on the train. But, it was in the summer of 68. Oh, that's even better, because then you say, you know, the fall semester is almost upon us. Yes, yes, June 24, 1968. Yeah, and... Uh, you know, all the riots and all that stuff, know, I'm your, sure that's helping. Your $18.50 would pay for the books for a young person entering this September, uh, you know... Uh, Something like that would certainly fit and wouldn't take up that much more copy space in his two-page letter. Yeah, it's just a two-page letter. I had a client recently said two page was too long. So <laughs> one thing else uh, David Ogilvie said is he longer copy outsells shorter copy, which is not controversial in the business, but I thought it was interesting. Well, anyway, Stuart, I appreciate you spending time. He's uh, David Ogilvie, you know, great guy to watch, read his books, YouTube uh, videos. Uh, anyway, um, if you'd like to contact me or maybe text me, tell me what you, uh, you agree with me or don't agree with me, uh, my number is 240-477-3999. Again, it's the Donor Doctor uh, signing out. Till next time. Bye.